Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending where you are in the world. Welcome. My name is Sandro Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome to this public health conversation. These conversations are meant as spaces where we engage with the issues that matter most for health. We are joined by expert speakers who help guide our thoughts towards a deeper understanding of these core issues. We are very glad you could join us today. I want to thank in particular the many who work to make events like this happen. In particular today, thank you to the Dean's Office and Marketing and Communications team, without whose work none of these events would take place. I would also like to thank Professor Lois McCloskey, our Chair of our Community Health Sciences Department, who was the intellectual architect behind the scenes of this event. Each year, about 4 million American women give birth. Supporting the health of mothers has long been a core concern of public health. Today, our goal is to discuss how we can more pers effectively pursue this focus, placing the needs of mothers at the heart of all we do. We are very fortunate to be joined by this distinguished panel, which will lead our discussion, and I'm very much looking forward to learning from all our guests. I'm going to turn the event over to our moderator, Priyan Priyanka McCloskey. Priyanka is a senior health reporter for WBUR, Boston's NPR news station. Before joining WBUR in 2022, she spent eight years as a healthcare reporter at the Boston Globe, and she previously covered health and medicine at the Boston Herald. Priyanka's uh, reporting spans health business and policy, medical research, and health disparities. She's focused on how the healthcare system serves and does not serve patients. Her recent work has chronicled the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic of patients, workers, and the healthcare system. I have learned tremendously from what Priyanka has done in the past few years. Over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dean Galea, for that kind introduction. I'm really honored to be here today to moderate today's public health conversation. And I'd like to introduce our speakers for this program. First, we're gonna hear from Ms. Marcella Howell, President and CEO of In Our Own Voice, National Black Women's Reproductive Health Agenda, a national state partnership with eight Black women's reproductive justice organizations with the goal of lifting up the voices of Black leaders on reproductive rights, health, and justice. Ms. Howell has over 40 years of experience and she's devoted to enhancing the role of Black women in national policy debates on issues that impact their lives. Then we'll turn it over to Dr. May Sivanarasset, who's an associate professor at the University of California, Los Angeles Fielding School of Public Health. Dr. Sivanarasset is trained as a social epidemiologist and her research focuses on understanding the social determinants of migrant, adolescent, and women's health, both globally and in the US. Third, we'll hear from Dr. Monica McLemore. Dr. McLemore is a tenured professor in the Child, Family, and Population Health Department and the interim director for the Center of Anti-Racism in Nursing at the University of Washington School of Nursing. Her program of research is focused on understanding reproductive health and justice. She is the recipient of numerous awards and currently serves as chair for the Sexual and Reproductive Health Section of the American Public Health Association. Fourth, we're gonna hear from Dr. Elizabeth Armstrong, who is an associate professor in the Department of Sociology with joint affiliations in the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs and the Office of Population, Population Research. Her research interests include public health, the history and sociology of medicine, risk in obstetrics and medical ethics. Finally, we'll have a presentation from Dr. Fiona Chalicum, clinical lecturer at King's College London. Her doctoral research examined the impact of perinatal obsessive compulsive disorder on women and children. She conducted the first randomized controlled tri trial of CBT for postpartum OCD, investigating treatment effects on anxiety and parenting. After all of our speakers finish their presentations, we'll begin our panel discussion. And I'll ask our audience to please submit your questions through the Q&A feature on Zoom. And I'll ask our panelists to please wait until the discussion to answer those questions. So um, I'm excited to, to learn a lot from all of you. Let's get started with Ms. Howell, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate being invited into this um, this gathering, especially with all of these doctors who will be talking specifically about clinical pieces. Um, out, my organization, as you, as you um, heard, is an organization that works on advocacy around um, a large number of issues, including Black maternal health. 
And so we, we look at things from that advocacy point, point of view. And that's what I'm gonna actually talk a little bit about at the, at the beginning of this. Um, for any woman or any birthing person, giving birth or becoming a mother should always be a joyous occasion. Um, we all hope that every woman or birthing person has excellent health care that helps them welcome their baby into a world where those reproductive health care needs are adequately covered. We hope that they enjoy the benefits of excellent prenatal and postpartum care and that their baby is well taken care of, whether they have a home birth, a hospital birth, or a birthing center. But we also know that that is not always the case. For many, especially women of low income, women of color and gender expansive people, what should be a joyous occasion is often met with pain, neglect and racism. Our organization does a number of polling every year. And one of the things that we always ask when, in our national polls and in our state polls is we ask women what things do they consider when they think about starting a family or expanding their family? And we expect them to say, well, they think about whether or not they have a good job, insurance coverage, money in the bank. But what we have also found out is that 61% of them say they think about being safe from police violence. 59% of them say they think about systemic racism when expanding a family or having a family. 58% say they think about having access to affordable housing, having access to quality affordable health care. They think about what the quality of the public schools are in their neighborhood. They think about whether or not they have access to healthy and affordable food options. Um, or having affordable child care. They think about things like black maternal health and whether or not they, their child will, um, whether or not they will have enough money to pay for uh, the child they're going to have. They think about the state of their neighborhood. That is, does the city take care of their neighborhood? Does the city collect the trash? Are the streets well kept? They think about, interesting enough, elections and how that will impact the state of their community and the state of their family. They think about having access to clean water. All of these things, if you are low income, are critical pieces that other women don't have to think about. And they also think about being safe from domestic violence in intimate relationships. So all of these things are things that black women, women of color, gender expansive people, women who have low income think about as they really think about whether or not they're going to have children and whether or not they are going to expand their families. And these days, because of the Supreme Court decision on Dobbs and the overturning of Roe v. Wade, they also think about what they can do and whether they can act, have access to full reproductive health care, including access to abortion services. So for Black women who are more likely to lack economic resources to be unemployed or underemployed or to be uninsured or underinsured or to be insured by programs that restrict their coverage, their insurance coverage, like being under Medicaid, their choices as they think about having a family are limited. And if you look at what has happened in the states now since the overturning of Roe v. Wade, those choices are even more limited. Even when it comes to whether or not having access to the full range of reproductive health care really impacts their life or their health. So we look at all of those things and we have to think about, and you will hear other people talk about 
the racism within the medical professions and how black women who are giving birth are treated differently in hospital settings sometimes, and even in birthing centers sometimes, how they are treated a little bit differently when they go into an OBGYN's office and they give them their Medicaid card as opposed to private insurance. All of those things do impact how black women and other women of color and gender expansive people, especially trans people, are treated in accessing the kind of care that we all hope people who are getting ready to give birth actually enjoy. And so those are the kind of things that I think we all have to address. We know, for instance, in looking at Latinx communities, Latinas are always concerned about what kind of health care they get, especially if they are in a state that has a really hard, has a really restrictive access in terms of whether or not they are documented or undocumented citizens. If they come into sessions where they want to get health care, but are afraid to go to any kind of clinic or any kind of hospital to get that health care as they are about to give birth because of their immigration status. So they are also concerned about that. Um, API women are concerned because there have been instances where legislation has been passed that prevents them from accessing full care to abortion services because there is a perception, an incorrect perception, that they might want to abort a fetus because that fetus is female. So there are all kinds of barriers. There are also barriers to language and not being able to access healthcare where the language they may speak is actually readily available to them when they come in looking for services. All of these things we need to be able to address. They are things that have come up quite um, to the forefront because of what has happened around the Dobbs decision. These things existed before, but very few people really paid full attention to them. And for Black women, for instance, there is, this, it, there is the issue of how people perceive the level of pain that Black women can endure when going through birth or after birth and what kind of pain they are in. And we've seen that with um, celebrities. We've seen it with low-income women. It really doesn't matter whether you have excellent health care insurance or if you have, are underinsured. The perception is what is the problem. And so when we ask people about what kind of things they consider when they are thinking about having a child or expanding their family. These answers should give people, especially people who are in the medical profession, pause to think about how a person walking into a healthcare environment perceives how they are going to be treated and what happens to them once they are there. We have fought very hard with a number of different organizations that look at maternal health care and have pushed to make sure, for instance, that Medicaid now covers a full year of postpartum care where they didn't used to, or that people who are low income are treated equally well as people who have excellent and high class um, medical insurance. These are the kind of things that we ask that people who are thinking about going into the healthcare professions really address and really look to their own bias and how they perceive people who are low income, people who are women of color, people who are trans, that they understand their own biases as they treat people and as they approach people who are about to give birth.
everyone deserves access to the full range of reproductive health care and the full self-determination and dignity on their own terms. This includes not just having good birth experiences, but also good postpartum experiences, making sure that their child is given the kind of services they deserve as well, regardless of their race or their economic status. And this also includes making sure that they have full access to abortion care if that abortion care is something that they decide they need instead of carrying a pregnancy to term. Right now, we are faced in a number of states because of the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe, where people are being forced to carry pregnancies to term. Forced motherhood is something that Black women has, have experienced in this country before, and we have determined that we will not go back to experiencing it ever again. That is something that we should also be aware of. The whole point of reproductive justice is to make sure that we have the right to make decisions about our bodies for ourselves and not have those decisions interfered with by politicians. This is where we are today. So as we think about the kind of health care we would like every pregnant person to have in as they decide to give birth, we must also think about the kind of full reproductive health care we want everyone to have in our society. And that should be making decisions for themselves, not having politicians make those decisions, not having people be able to come after and vigilantes watching them and watching their loved ones to see what decisions they are making or having the internet, different internet services, policing what we research. All of those things are critical to making sure that everyone has the kind of experience in childbirth and becoming a parent that we would want for ourselves and our own children. And that's what I want to raise as we think about what everyone will be talking about today in terms of looking at the kind of services that every person deserves in this country, whether they are low income, LGBTQ people, immigrants, or people who have a full range of very expensive health insurance. It should not matter if you fall into any of those categories, and it should not matter what the geography is in terms of where you live. You should all have access to the kind of healthcare services and reproductive healthcare services that this country should offer to every single person. And I'm gonna stop there and um, turn this back over to our moderator. Thank you so much, Ms. Howell, for kind of setting that con here. Um, uh, let's turn it over now to Dr. Sudhanartha. Thank you so much. Um, are you all able to see my screen? Just making sure, great. Um, Hello everyone, I'm Mesa Dinarzad. I'm Associate Professor and Vice Chair of Community Health Sciences at the Fielding School of Public Health. And today I wanted um, to give the perspective of immigrant uh, in the US, thinking about centering mothers in the public health agenda. First, an overview, a very quick overview of immigrant mothers. Um, in line with the healthy immigrant effect, the most recent data suggests that immigrant women have a lower maternal mortality rate than their US born counterparts. However, this continues to be de debated as data between 2000 and 2006 find a higher rate of maternal mortality among Hispanic and Asian immigrant women compared to their US born counterparts. 
What's clear is that both US and foreign born Black, Hispanic, and Asian Pacific Islander women are at increased risk of dying from pregnancy complications than white women are, regardless of immigration status. We know that the health advantage erodes over time um, due to quality of care and lack of access to quick care. These inequities are rooted in the historical and contemporary immigration policies and state level immigrant exclusions that specifically target immigrant uh, of color. This goes back to the first federal immigration policy in the US in 1875, the PAGE Act, which barred Chinese women from entering the US to, to present day policies like public charge and 287G, which allows for local and state policies to collaborate with the federal government in order to enforce federal immigration policies. Exclusionary federal and state level immigration policies create a climate of social exclusion, heightened vigilance and suspicion. And combined, the system of racialized exclusion control has been linked to poor birth outcomes through stress and restrictions to health promoting resources. I wanted to use today the reproductive framework, justice framework to orient my, my work today. So reproductive justice, as Ms. Howell um, already talked about, is a movement guided by the belief that real choice and control over ourselves and our bodies is achieved when we have the power and resources to make our own decisions. It recognizes the right to not have children or to have children. If one decides to have children, to decide how many and under what conditions, and the right to parent one's own children in a safe and healthy environment. This includes free from coercion, free from uh, fear from the state and freedom from violence in its many forms. I want to first recognize that when we center the needs of mothers, we also need to consider what happens before they become a mother if they choose to do that. We conducted a survey of 125 undocumented immigrants in California aged 18 to 40, 40 years old, uh, including in-depth interviews. Um, we were really interested in understanding him, how immigration status and documentation status influenced their fertility decisions, whether they wanted to have children, not have children, or delay childbearing. We found that almost 40% reported that their immigration status impacted their fertility decisions. About 20% uh, reported fear of being deported as reasons. 23% uh, included uh, describing lack of economic resources related to their immigration status. Another 6% discussed immigration processes such as facilitators and delays in their immigration status. And then 12% talked about future uncertainties or instability about immigration status. And I'll go through um, a couple of, of quotes that I pulled um, for this. Um, here's an example of fear, fear of deportation. So one person said, even though I already have kids, I still get afraid of getting deported and my kids staying and being raised without me. Um, and others actually experienced their own parents being deported. So another person said, my mom was deported and I was left to take care of my siblings and father. I never want to put my kids in that position. There's also the intersection between immigration status and economic res uh, resources. I'm just going to start at that kind of the middle there. Um, but one person said, but at this current moment, because of my immigration status, the financial backlog that I have to catch up and make a living for myself and also support my family, I just don't think I can support future generations. There's no hope for a future family. I don't want kids. We also had a number of participants talked about the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals in the 10 U.S. state of DACA right now in the U.S., that it can go away at any time. Um, one Mexican 27-year-old said, I would be concerned of the stress that would bring to my partner and my children, my parents, and my entire family. Another South Korean 25-year-old uh, um, undocumented person said, I never take this situation for granted. DACA itself can be always pulled away. I might be left with nothing. I could be left with even worse where I am not protected at all. Um, these are some of the reasons that influences their fertility decisions um, or not having children. In summary, not all people have the same right to have or not have children. Immigrant mothers contend with the fear of deportation, lack of economic and social resources provided to citizen immigrants, and the uncertainties that their lives, um, but also their unborn children um, have, and as well as partners and families. 
Next, I wanted to discuss the right to have children if uh, folks decide to have children, and importantly, under what conditions they have those children for immigrants to decide um, whether they, they actually want to, to have them and whether their values and needs are actually reflected in that. So do, do all birthing people have the same right to have children and under the conditions they want? So this is a study that I conducted with uh, some colleagues at UCLA. Um, and we analyze state level immigrant policies and the influence on preterm birth uh, by nativity status. We looked at two independent policy variables. So we were really interested in both criminalizing immigrant policies. So these are policies that create mechanisms of surveillance and immigration enforcement across um, work authorization, immigration enforcement and uh, uh, criminal justice system. We also wanted to identify protective factors. So what are the inclusive immigrant policies that grant non-citizen residents access to state in institutions across legal, health, social, education, labor, and uh, employment sector? And what we found, not surprisingly, is that inclusive policies decrease the risk of preterm birth for all immigrant women. And when we looked specifically by race and ethnicity, we found that criminalizing policies were associated with a 5% increase in preterm birth among Black women born outside the US compared to women living in states with less criminalizing policies. And the bottom line here is, is the real need to center Black immigrant mothers as they experience the intersections of the criminal justice system and immigration enforcement system and how they may be disproportionately impacted by the intersections of these uh, systems. In addition to broader immigrant policies, there's also a need for comprehensive language access during maternity care. Language access is defined as providing individuals with limited English proficiency access access to the same services provided to English speakers in their own language. And I have to note that in California and a number of other states, there's laws that mandate translated written materials and interpretation services for spoken interactions at each point in service. And so we really wanted to understand um, whether and, and to the extent that this was true in maternity care settings, um, we conducted in-depth interviews with Mexican and Chinese uh, immigrant mothers in California to better understand the, the role of language access in maternity care. Uh, there were a number of instances of language discrimination. One Mexican woman shared the perception that some physicians required patients to speak English, and this is really a violation of pa patients' rights. Um, so one, one person says the doctor who says, oh, you have to speak English, or sometimes they don't have things accessible to people who do not speak English. There are people who feel that they have the right to say to people that they should speak English. A number of folks also talked about inadequate informed consent, particularly for uh, Mexican mothers. Um, there was a, a real description of negative experiences with being inadequately informed. So this includes being partially informed, incomprehensible language, or inadequate description of available alternatives. So here's an example. They cut my womb, I couldn't do anything. They told me, I have to operate on you. No more kids. Your body says no more. I'm going to give you the papers and you sign. I had therapy because I stayed very sad thinking that I wouldn't have kids. And, and in line with this, another woman says, the doctor starts saying, have you thought about having an operation, referring to a hysterectomy um, or sterilization? You have to be operated on because you're quite old to continue having children. You don't have to think about it. You, you just have to do it. She was mad and asked why I had so many kids at the age I was, and it, I didn't like that treatment. Particularly in Los Angeles, where these interviews occurred, there's been a history of involuntary sterilizations, particularly among people of color and immigrants. And this continues to result in mistrust of in, uh, institutions among immigrants, even in a um, integration state like California. Lastly, I wanted to bring up this last quote, which I think summarizes immigrant mother's ability to parent in a safe environment, which is um, the final uh, tenet of the reproductive justice framework. So this quote is not from a mother, it's actually from a, a person who describes her mother's experiences and their own experiences as an undocumented child. 
um, and the struggle of their own mother. Um, her mother had been in a terrible car accident without access to health care and became homeless because of the huge financial burdens of, of health care. And they say this, people would always talk about the American dream. What is it? You have people living here in the United States, but there's no American dream for them. There were times where I would literally, sometimes I would just kind of let my mom scream herself to sleep, scream her pain, but I would kind of lay awake there crying and wish like, why can't I have that house? Why can't I have that white picket fence? Why can't I have the green grass? Why can't my family have that benefit of getting health care? So in, in summary, I, I wanted to say that there's a real need to center immigrant mothers in the public health agenda. States in particular play a really important role in immigrant policy making, both in thinking about simultaneously integrating um, immigrants across a number of policy domains, but also decriminalizing um, immigrants. The context of historical injustice and course of policies that have targeted non-English speaking immigrants in part relied on immigrants' lack of language access in reproductive health care. We know that reproductive autonomy cannot be achieved without access to culturally and linguistically appropriate health care. We need to beyond, move beyond thinking about language proficiency as an individual factor that's rooted in concepts like acculturation and culture to really focusing it focusing language as a structural level resource that needs to be made available at each point in service to all immigrants. Thank you very much. I will turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you for that presentation and that really important work on immigrant mothers. Um, next, we're going to hear from Dr. McLemore. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening uh, to everyone from where you are. Uh, I want to thank Marcella and May for uh, setting me up beautifully to be able to talk about a couple of things I'm, I'm really interested in talking about. It is such a, a gift to be able to share space with all of you on the panel. Let me start my comments. I'm not sharing slides. I am going to read some prepared comments that I will make available to the uh, entire team to be sent out to folks, and I'll probably publish them on my Medium channel. Uh, you have my uh, affirmative consent to screenshot, live tweet, you know, write my words. I think it's really important uh, that we amplify the work that we're doing because if Nazis, bots, and trolls are the only people who are using, you know, social media and other public health tools to be able to talk directly to the public, we can't be mad when misinformation runs rampant. So let me start off with a quote from Toni Morrison, who is a mother of mine and an elder and somebody that I just love. This is from A Slow Walk of Trees, as her grandmother would say, Hopeless, as her grandfather would say, this was published in the New York Times Magazine in 1976. Quote, they clarify our past, make livable our present, and are certain to shape our future. And since the future is where our immortality as a race lies, no overview of the state of Black people at this time can ignore some speculation on the only ones who are certain to live it, the children, end quote. I would like to thank uh, Boston University School of Public Health for inviting me to provide a simple framework that I have been developing to assist people to begin having the same conversations. One of the huge limitations that we're seeing play out in public health and clinical health services provision is a misalignment of conversations with our values and our resources. I believe this is one of the fundamental, fundamental reasons why we have not been able to make impactful change in resolving the Black maternal health crisis in the United States, COVID-19, and a whole host of other public health issues. I now never have to explain again why it has been so difficult to fund prevention interventions or prevention efforts, neither in sexual reproductive health or in infectious diseases, because we've all lived through almost three years of a stark example of why that hasn't been possible. We are currently at a pivotal moment where everything we have ever valued in public health is up in the air. Many of the proxies that we use to assess maternal child health have been rendered almost meaningless by the Dobbs decision. For example, as my good friend, Dr. Joya Creer Perry has always pointed out and that Marcella hinted at, marital status is a useless proxy because when two poor people decide to parent, you now have three people attempting to live on the wages of two poor people. Similarly, 
early entry to prenatal care will need to be reimagined in the context of our current situation because it's not precise enough to capture that you may have spent a whole month or longer traveling across state lines to a, receive a wanted abortion that you were unable to obtain. So despite the fact that you might have had an ultrasound, seen healthcare providers, talked to counselors, that somehow doesn't count. This is one of the many reasons why we need to operationalize reproductive justice as made beautifully outlined, along with reproductive health and reproductive rights. So with my time, I'd like to take the opportunity to frame our discussion such that we can have a shared decision about what it will take to transform public health and clinical health services provision towards improved reproductive justice, particularly maternal health. And as a reminder, let me provide the definitions for retrofit, reform, and reimagine from Merriam-Webster Dictionary. To retrofit something is to furnish something like a computer, an airplane, or a building with new or modified parts or equipment not available or considered necessary at the time of the original manufacture. Or it means to adapt to a new purpose or a new need. It's important for us to understand that in a retrofit, the main shape of whatever we're trying to retrofit does not change. The main structure does not change. The definition of reform is to change or to put into an improved form or condition, to amend or improve by change of form or removal of faults or abuses. We need a lot of reformation in public health and clinical health services provision because a lot of times we don't give ourselves permission to remove things. We always adding something, right? So retrofit, the main structure is going to stay exactly the same in reformation, you can change the main structure of something. In fact, you can remove things. This is a really important distinction. Everybody likes to spend a lot of time reimagining, which is to imagine a new or again, uh, to recreate. But there's something to really think about like reimagining because if we all spend our time dreaming, then we don't develop interventions for the people in the now who currently need our help. So let me walk you through three exemplars to get us prepared to answer a lot of questions and to have a rich discussion specific to how do we really redirect our focus back to public health interventions for pregnant capable people and to improve maternal health. Let's start with the whole appreciation that pregnancy is yet one of many outcomes or birth, excuse me, is yet one of many outcomes of pregnancy. And there are other outcomes. So it's real difficult to talk about this in a vacuum. First, most people will spend more times in their lives avoiding pregnancy than being pregnant. I mean, simple math tells you that if in the United States, the reproductive window for people on average is between the ages of 15 and 44, and most people in the United States only have between two and three children, if you factor in the recommended 18 months in between births, at most, people will spend eight years of their lives at some point in, in the state of pregnancy or immediately postpartum. So the range for actual pregnancy is like 29 years, but you're only gonna spend eight of them actually in some form of pregnancy or postpartum. This brings me to my second point, that without a robust social safety net, we will either pay for healthcare on the front end, if you're lucky and get healthy babies and healthy moms and healthy families, or we'll pay for on the back end in elderly and elder care. And in my mind, these things go hand in hand, since to my knowledge, immortality is not ethical nor currently possible. And that said, affording the humans the things that we need to lead a dignified and healthy life requires investments in health and human services, which brings me to my third point. And that is any solutions, any retrofits, any reformations, any reimagining that we think about must include our entire society. And I say this as a person who's never been pregnant, who's never birthed, a childless by choice, I never wanted to be a parent, but there is a role for everybody in the work that we need to do. And any solutions we must propose must be generated and led by people with lived experience. And this does not let anybody off the hook for creating the future that we all wish to build. 
So let me finish by saying, I fully believe that we have the tools, the brilliance, and the political will in our current time to address these issues without compromising on what people deserve. We have a robust evidence to show that our healthcare outcomes in the United States can be improved, particularly when we already know that the outcomes for white pregnant capable people are not the best we can get in the world. So I am hoping this discussion as we move forward to the panel and hear the other panelists will be brown, grounded in a, one simple principle that our curiosity will allow us to get beyond these past ineffective solutions and we need to stop thinking that retrofits are our only possibility. We can reform and reimagine with whom we work and how we work to be able to move towards health equity and improved outcomes. I look forward to the discussion and Priyanka, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. McElmore. That was really uh, important remarks. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over now to Dr. Armstrong. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Galeo and uh, all of the panelists. It is truly an honor to be in this conversation today with all of you uh, as colleagues and, and everyone watching. Um, can everyone see my screen? Okay, great, thank you. Um, Let's see, I'm having trouble, there we go. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit today about where do babies come from? We know that babies do not come from assembly lines and they also don't come from cabbages. But how does contemporary American culture imagine where babies come from? I wanna start with a thought experiment. Can I ask you all to visualize the fetus Capture in your mind the first picture that comes to your mind when I say visualize the fetus and just hold on to that. I'm gonna come back to it in a moment. I also wanna start my remarks today with a couple of facts that are often invisible in public discourse. For example, it's a little known and little discussed fact among most people that the leading cause of hospitalization in the United States today is childbirth. It's also little known that the most frequently performed surgery in the United States today is cesarean section. And I'm grateful to Dr. McLemore for just pointing out another invisibility in her um, quantification of the roughly eight years that people spend pregnant or immediately postpartum relative to that long 29, 30 year lifespan of being potentially pregnant. Birth and death are the bookends of human existence here on this planet. Both have tremendous psychological, cultural, personal and spiritual meaning. Yet while we have had a robust debate spanning decades about what it means to have a good death, and how medicine should be reformed to honor people's wishes and beliefs in dying, we have lacked a parallel societal discussion about what it means to have a good birth or how we can best care for and support people through the birthing process in a way that honors and respects them as individuals and the sacredness of birth itself. In fact, we have startling new evidence that reproductive care is actually a site of disempowerment, abuse, degradation, and belittlement, that obstetric violence and obstetric racism permeate the way we care for pregnant and birthing people in the United States today, and that these burdens fall most heavily on women, pregnant and birthing people who experience structural disadvantage racism, and other systematic, systemic obstacles to their humanity. All of these examples of invisibility that I am giving you today illustrate what anthropologists Rainer Rapp and Faye Ginsburg have called the invisible centrality of reproduction. Reproduction is central to human society. It's the foundation of families, of kinship systems, of communities, of nations, of 
the entire uh, global economy. And yet pregnancy and uh, birth and reproduction more generally are often marginalized and uh, pushed to the edges of society. They're rarely centered the way they're being centered in this conversation today. Not only are pregnant people, pregnant and birthing women and new mothers often invisible in public discourse, when they are visible, they're often treated as means to an end, as mere vessels. The reasons for this invisibility are deep and multidimensional. I'd like to focus today on the role of popular culture, particularly visual culture, in both reflecting and perpetuating the cultural invisibility of reproduction and the people who are central to it, most often but not exclusively women and girls and everyone else with capacity for pregnancy. So in order to do that, let me go back to the question I asked you a few minutes ago. How many of you, I know I can't see a show of hands, but many of you may have seen something like this when I asked you to visualize the fetus, an ultrasound, a medical ultrasound image. Others of you may have seen something like this, a free floating fetus or embryo at various stages of development. Probably very few of you, when I asked you to visualize a fetus, saw something like this, the fetus located inside the body of a pregnant woman. And I use this thought exercise to illustrate two points. First, the ubiquity of the fetus as a visible icon. A hundred years ago, most of us would not have been able to visualize a fetus. It was not an image or a picture that was readily accessible to most of us in popular culture. Today, fetuses are everywhere. Fetal imagery uh, is ubiquitous in popular culture and in political discourse. The second thing this thought exercise helps to ex uh, illustrate is the historic disconnection of the fetus from the pregnant body in which it necessarily and always resides. Fetuses do not exist. They cannot be alive except inside another human being, inside another person's body, often, although not exclusively, a woman's body. So how and why did we come to separate the fetus from the pregnant woman? And what are the consequences of doing so? Well, the visual roots of the ubiquity of the fetus begin in 1965 with a uh, photo essay published in Life magazine, which purported to show the drama of life before birth. Many of you will have seen these images or images like them. These were made by Leonard Nielsen, a Swedish photographer. Since Nielsen published these photographs in Life magazine in 1965, images like this have become uh, ubiquitous in American culture, not uh, in part through the work of the pro-life movement, but also through medical imagery. Uh, and in fact, medical technology has been another important conduit of making fetal fetuses visible. Most Pregnant women, pregnant people in the United States today receive multiple ultrasounds during pregnancy, and the ultrasound image itself has been uh, popularized and domesticated. It's moved outside of the realm of medical technology exclusively into popular culture. You can see some examples here where a, a medical tech wrote, hi, mom and dad, see you soon on the medical ultrasound image. And we also see the way medical ultrasound images are used in popular culture. We also see the commodification and the uh, turning the fetus into both a consumer object and the fetus itself as a consumer, personifying the fetus as a consumer. All of these images of the fetus perpetuate the idea that the fetus is somehow separate and distinct from the pregnant woman. The images that I've shown you take the fetus outside of the context of the pregnant person's body and make it into uh, a distinct individual on its own. And indeed, when we picture pregnant women in popular culture, we have a tendency to imagine them as animals, as storks or as fruits or vegetables or other kinds of containers as these images suggest. 
And moreover, images of pregnant women in popular culture often perpetuate a kind of symbolic violence. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of uh, Google images, image searches. The first one here is for uh, pregnancy and the next one is for pregnant, uh, pregnant woman. I search for pregnant woman here. If you look at these images, you can see that the majority of them depict a pregnant abdomen only. The person who is pregnant is depicted without a head, sometimes limbless. Um, and in fact, for the, the screenshot, let me go back to this one. This screenshot here, there are 44 images, 38 of them depict a pregnant woman, 21 of those include a head, and only 14 show that pregnant woman's face. If we look at the second set of images, there's 66 images, only 41 depict a pregnant woman with a head, only 31 depict her with a face. And in only four of the images is the pregnant person looking directly back at the viewer. So even our images of pregnancy, when they're not explicitly about the fetus, have the feature of depersonifying and dehumanizing the pregnant person. From these images, it would appear that headlessness and even limblessness are common side effects of pregnancy. In other words, so much about our popular culture, our popular visual culture, serves to elevate the fetus and make the pregnant woman or the pregnant person invisible. I argue that this symbolic representation of pregnancy and pregnant people both reflects and perpetuates cultural and political attitudes that treat pregnant bodies as disposable and as inconsequential. But in fact, the best guarantor of fetal health and well being has always been maternal health and well being. We need to make women visible again. We need to make women and pregnant people visible again in order to recenter mothers in public health. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Armstrong. That was really fascinating. Thank you. Now we'll turn it over to Dr. Chalicum for our last presentation. You can probably tell straight away, uh, I'm not from the US, I'm from the UK. Um, and I'm really honoured to be part of this discussion. Thank you so much for having me. And not a little humbled, really, by hearing all of the previous speakers. Thank you so much. So um, I'm Fiona. I'm going to uh, shine a bit of a light on uh, perinatal mental health and the UK context, which are uh, some things that I have uh, some things to contribute to in this space. And I really want to highlight um, I'm going to be talking about sort of maternal mental health and really highlight some things which have made a difference in the UK context. So uh, I'm sure many of you already know um, that there are uh, very many um, mental health difficulties that are very common in the um, perinatal period, so pregnancy up to uh, one year. Uh, and should be longer, really. Uh, so this is these are UK um, English statistics, in fact, so multiplied many times in your context, but actually show uh, that actually uh, about 20% of women um, suffer from some kind of difficulty at this time. And that's in high income countries with a even higher prevalence in low and middle in income countries. Um, and there's some longitudinal data that suggests that prevalence is increasing by generations. And actually, this is a re very recent US study showing rates of depression in girls uh, rising um, and rates of uh, difficulties in young people uh, rising much more highly uh, than in the older generation. Um, and in young girls, even higher than boys. So going from 11% to 23%, so a three times the rise in boys. And connected with this, it seems that young mums uh, are experiencing even higher rates. Uh, so in our London context, we uh, did a study of young mums um, and about two thirds of those had a, a diagnosable problem and more uh, critical analysis of that uh, shortly. But lots of that was explained by uh, anxiety and particularly um, experiences of trauma. 
And so these problems, of course, by definition, impairing uh, for women. But if that wasn't bad enough in itself, we're also talking about high levels of exposure of children to a caring environment that's impacted by these problems. Um, and again, it seems to be rising. So in this UK context from 22 to 25 percent over a 10 year period of children exposed to maternal uh, illness. Um, and you can see from the graph on the right, that first exposure is very weighted to this perinatal period. It's such a difficult time. And we know that um, the parental mental health disorders are uh, associated with uh, increased risks um, of all sorts of outcomes related to children. Um, just to take the example um, of depression here. Um, and this, this review highlights a whole range of areas that children might be affected. And of course, some of the mechanisms, family conflict, um, poorer functioning for uh, parents um, in terms of their availability and sensitivity, uh, fewer safe parenting practices, um, such as using car seats and uptake of vaccinations. And these effects tend to persist uh, across childhood. So there really are kind of long-standing ramifications and public health implications for both parent and child. But of course, uh, these things uh, are not inevitable and they're not evenly spread as well as all of our previous speakers have highlighted very clearly and eloquently. Um, but there are modifiable factors, so social adversity, the presence of other adults, um, having a positive relationship with children, the couple relationship, and of course, how severe and persistent the um, issue is for the mother. And that's, of course, the goal of uh, some treatment. So uh, there are some really good examples showing that if we can treat people, if we can treat women effectively, then we can reduce some of that impact on children. And this is uh, the results of a, a big American study shown here. So we do have treatments that can work, but of course there are issues at literally every point on the care pathway, identifying people, uh, getting access to services, um, even when uh, treatment's given, given adequately, um, and treatment response. So again, this is a, a US study, but there's a, a very high uh, drop-off rate really, even from the, I think, inadequate, we could say, number of people who are identified. So uh, in the UK context, we really didn't have great services um, before 2014. And although we knew about this impact on um, mothers, birthing people and children, uh, certainly in the ivory towers of research institutions, our clinical services were not mirroring this and providing that needed help. And in fact, we're kind of non-existent in many areas. So what we, what we did have was a lot of um, expert by experience led charities in perinatal mental health. You can see that little logo on the bottom right there. About 100 of these, um, more than, got together and formed something called the Maternal Mental Health Alliance. Um, so it was just an umbrella organization for all these incredible third sector organizations that worked in psychosis, depression and um, all the different areas. And they commissioned a systematic review and an economic report with one of the universities here that collated all that evidence. And as you can see from the infographic here, there were some really arresting findings that for us, the long term cost to society was about £8.1 billion for each year of untreated maternal mental illness in the UK. So that meant for us at the time about £10,000 for every single birth in the country. And most of those costs related to ongoing costs for the, the child. So really, I think what actually persuaded the politicians was that the cost of not treating were about five times the costs of actually putting some money in treating these uh, difficulties. Um, and at this point, only about half of women had any access at all to services. So the Maternal Mental Health Alliance embarked on this campaign, they're called Turn the Map Green. Um, and the government put about £365 million pounds, um, to de the development of new services. So we have um, outpatient um, community mental health services, we have mother and baby units. Um, and now, just most recently, uh, we have specialised um, services related to maternal loss. Um, so you can see from these uh, graphics that actually it's had a, a huge effect and that really was from the work of uh, this Maternal Mental Health Alliance. 
And of course, one of the key things is not just turning the map green, but keeping it green. So again, their campaign is ongoing um, and we have in our NHS uh, knows what's happening now but we have aspirations over the the next five years um, and perinatal mental health is really embedded in what the government say is the long-term plan so it really has i think put down roots in terms of the importance in the uk context which is amazing so these changes are really important but of course they're still not enough and if we're centering mothers in this agenda who should we be looking for um, and this one really influential review looked at predictors of anxiety and depression, which make up a, a large percentage of the problems. Um, and I haven't documented every single one from the review, but you'll see that many of these are, of course, to do with wider social difficulties um, and inequalities. So this review commented on a lack of evidence of paternal and partner mental health, but there is, of course, increasing evidence that this not only impacts children, but impacts maternal mental health as well and health outcomes. We know that domestic violence uh, is hugely prevalent and often starts during pregnancy and, of course, is associated with unwanted pregnancies and pre can cause pregnancy loss too. So these, where I put these uh, characteristics of the pregnancy, uh, they don't happen in a vacuum. And again, many, all of the other speakers have, have touched on this. And in the UK, uh, we are, of course, uh, no different in terms of having uh, huge health inequalities and disparities according to race. We have a system which collects all the evidence about each maternal death to try and really um, help understanding and prevention. And in one of our most recent reports, we found that ethnic disparities in terms of uh, childbirth um, complications and maternal deaths were really uh, no other explanation but due to the care received. And that was mirrored in another population study uh, and so on. So this really, of course, has to be at the forefront in our thinking of how we develop and, and deliver services. And again, that really is coming through. We can't um, get any grant funding without explicit recognition um, of these inequalities and what we are actually doing within every single grant to uh, address these and acknowledge these. So we're really lucky to have uh, a wider coverage of services, but still a long way to go. Um, and the Paternal Mental Health Alliance, their latest campaign is to make all care count. Um, so it's to keep up this development of services, support sustainable, high quality work in professionals and encourage every single person who has contact with women and birthing people to be aware and to make a difference uh, in terms of access to services, in terms of all other forms of support. So interactions at every level are, are important. So just to summarise, the, the perinatal period is a time of increased risk for these types of difficulties, but is a time of increased opportunity. People are in contact with services and often hugely motivated um, to engage in, in any sort of intervention. Um, we know that um, paternal and partner mental health is, of course, really important, but interacts with maternal mental health. So it does just affect uh, at least three people in every um, unit um, where those people are, are around. Um, and it is, uh, as I say, a time for um, increased opportunity to intervene. So you really do get um, a lot of bang for your buck in terms of these interactions and interventions. And it goes without saying that therefore improved maternal mental health outcomes mean improved outcomes for everybody. And that's all I've got to say on that one. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chalicom. And thanks to all of our, our speakers. And I, I'm definitely learning a lot today. And I, I'm sure our audience is as well. Um, so um, I'd like to ask all our speakers to, to join us back on camera for the discussion. Um, if audience members have questions, please put it in the Q&A um, on your screen. And we'll try to get to your questions. Um, I, I will kick it off. Um, so uh, we, we covered a lot of ground here. Um, I mean, one of the, um, the, the data that's becoming apparent now in, as we're more than two years into the pandemic um, is just the worsening outcomes for um, 
for pregnant women, pregnant people, um, maternal health outcomes that have gotten worse, especially for Black women um, in the U.S. And I'm wondering how you're you're thinking about that. Why are we going in the wrong direction? What's it going to take to turn this around? And maybe Ms. Howell or um, Dr. McLemore want to kick us off there. Wait. Well, I'm always going to defer to Marcella at first, uh, unless she wants me to go. Well, I was going to actually defer to you first, but <laughs> I, I can talk a little bit about it. I think that um, we are looking at the outcomes be not improving. I want to talk about the improvement, that the outcomes are not improving because Black women specifically did not have the resources during the COVID pandemic to actually access doctors. More and more doctors were not seeing patients in their offices. They were doing telehealth. And if you're of low income and you don't have um, good access to the internet and stuff, you couldn't do the telehealth type, type of thing, the type of services that others might be able to get. And because um, people were concerned about COVID themselves and a number of uh, black women were getting COVID, even though they might've been getting vaccinations and stuff. So we, we watched the COVID pandemic negatively impact black communities at higher rates than for white women. And that just exacerbated um, some of the maternal health outcomes as well. So we were looking at a health pandemic where there already was a health pandemic for black women. So you add on another health pandemic and you basically get worse outcomes again. And, and that's part of the problem that we are facing is that each time there is some kind of health outcome that impacts Black women, you put that on top of what is already impacting us. And so you're going to have worsening outcomes. I guess that's, that's the way I'll put it without being scientific about it. Well, and I think it's spot on. I mean, I'm gonna put a timer on because I can talk about this all day. Right. Because, and let me speak directly to the clinicians, the public health practitioners, because this is on us. I wrote a piece in Scientific American, March 26th of 2020, that was really around why COVID-19 was not a reason to abandon pregnant people. And I stand by every word, right? We, we had a prime opportunity to think about auxiliary maternity units and drive-through baby showers and using hotels differently and stopping the, you know, 4 million births, 98% of births are in the United States happen in hospitals, right? And birth is not a, a disease to be managed. So, you know, I see Dr. Armstrong, because I'm, I was with her when she was talking, because we needed to rethink, and we had a chance. I still think we do, right? We can still retrofit this notion that of the 4 million births, like prior to COVID-19, pregnancy and childbirth was the number one reason why people were admitted to hospitals and healthcare institutions. So you can't tell me that we couldn't do differently, but we were barring doulas and the other co-parent from participating in a process where we were, pro try think about the courage that you need to propagate the human species during a global pandemic. And that the best we could offer them was family separation, but then we are gonna send you home with those same individuals. like. I need yeah. us as clinicians and public health people to think more broadly because that was stupid, right? You gonna isolate people in the hospital, but then you're gonna send them all home together. Like we need to stop and call a pause and to really think about our policies, procedures, and practices before and stop reacting yeah. to everybody else's agenda and really start to pull together. And that's why discussions like this is so important so that we can get real clear about what our priorities are. Because until we do that, we're going to keep making the same mistake over and over again. And here we are in yet another winter and we have no protective policies, procedures or practices. And we're going to keep describing, right, these poor outcomes of pandemic on top of a pandemic on top of a pandemic. And we can do something about that as a field. And we can do something about that as clinicians and public health practitioners.
Thank you. Does anyone else want to speak to that? Are there any um, silver linings from the pandemic years, any opportunities that have arisen that, you know, are we seeing any progress as a result of the things that actually got worse the last couple of years? We are seeing in some states that people, um, politicians, advocacy groups, doctors are looking at what you need to actually make the outcomes, the health outcomes better. And there have been bills introduced in some states that fund doulas, for instance, in this in 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 um, looking at maternal health issues. Not a lot of states, um, but in some that look at um, postpartum care, in you know, and expanding that into you know to cover people so that they um, cover mothers and, and birthing people so that they are getting better health care. Because we know that for Black women, a lot of the maternal mortality is post-birth and not actually giving them the kind of care that they need or monitoring them through the care they need. And so there have been some postpartum. There was at one point, um, you know, a whole maternal momnibus package in um, in President Biden's um, plan that, you know, never quite made it to the floor of a Congress because of Republican opposition. And we had to fight as he started paring down what was in that that care package. We had to fight to make sure those maternal pieces, maternal health pieces stayed in that plan and they are still in there. But, you know, it's like the plan itself is in limbo again. I mean, why would politicians who say they, you know, they want to take care of mothers literally fight against maternal health being in some of these packages that that should that should we should all care and and you know as i said at the beginning of this this is something that we should all care about and should be all invested in and yet we've got you know politicians and politics entering into um fighting against maternal health and um so there are all of those kind of pieces at at, at some state levels but not at a national level as it should be Can I just jump in and, and echo that and point out that for so long, maternity care, reproductive health, these have been regarded as quote unquote women's issues that affect only half the population. Birth is universal. There is no other way to arrive on this planet than through somebody else's body. So we have to start acknowledging that maternity care, reproductive health, reproductive justice, these are not women's issues. These are not things that affect only women and girls or people who identify as women and girls or people who have the relevant body parts. These are literally universal policies that affect everyone and we need to start treating them that way and holding all politicians, regardless of gender, accountable for a view that centers the universality of uh, this form of healthcare. So we're talking about some really big issues that intersect here with housing, poverty, you know, structural racism. This is all part of that reproductive justice backdrop. But is there one, um, one or two simple changes that could happen right now to prenatal or postnatal care that could make a dent? Um, any, any suggestions or a wish list from our panelists? Well, first thing we could do is give people a basic minimum income. We could take pregnancy coverage outside of the disability systems. We could push employers to actually really get them to invest in paid family leave. And we could really, really start to think about this notion of what is universal coverage for people look like regardless of their pregnancy capable status. I could keep going, but I'm gonna pass to somebody else. And we could also stop inducing people into labor when their body is not ready to give birth. And that is um, giving birth should be 
at the benefit of the person giving birth, not at the doctors who have schedules. And we should be making sure that the kind of health care that we are giving people as they who are going to give birth is the health care they need, not at the convenience of practitioners. I would just add, you know, simple things like in language services in a way that folks comprehend and understand paid family leave, like Dr. McLemore just said. And then also something that Marcella, I think, alluded to was expanding health insurance coverage, right? So beyond the 60 days to 12 months postpartum, maybe even beyond, including perinatal mental health services. We have a lot of questions coming in from the audience, so I'll turn to one of those. Um, so how can we use hospital-based birth centers to empower patients and improve maternal health outcomes? So birth is an episode and prenatal care is nine months. And as Chanel Portia says from Angel Song Doulas, postpartum is forever. So we invest all our dollars at an episode when quite frankly, they actually could be better spent elsewhere. So I am not, a, there's a whole lot of perinatal equity collaboratives that are trying to figure out how to deal with birth centers within hospitals and healthcare institutions. In fact, March of Dimes is hosting a meeting on that right now. So that's a retrofit. We need some reformation in my opinion. And again, coming back to if pregnancy is not a disease and we need to support normal physiological birth, then that means we need to reimagine where our dollars go and that perhaps maybe the exclusive focus on the episode of birth within the context of hospitals might need some intervention. This I mean, I'm Oh, so I'm an outsider here, so do excuse my uh, ignorance. Uh, but it's hard to make sense of, I guess, because it, it seems as, you know, as you're all saying, it's the onward implications are so, so clear. So having that investment and having when, you know, people are in contact with services, it's a chance to try and do so much, not just confined to this particular time, as I think you're saying. Um, but yeah, a, an opportunity that when people are in contact, you know, potentially non-stigmatizing or less stigmatizing environment to, to engage them in an onward way. Another question from the audience, this also for Dr. Talakum can probably um, answer this one. Is there an effort in the US equivalent to the UK to focus on addressing mental health issues among pregnant and birthing mothers? And if so, how can it gain greater visibility? I mean, there are some fantastic researchers um, and of course many activists in the UK, but in the US, um, but obviously you're on a different scale and you've got a, a very different system to, to deal with. But um, yeah, I think certainly those things are being thought about um and but you know it's the basics you know that are that are missing just having kind of maternity leave which is something other high income countries absolutely take for granted so the efforts to kind of you know deal with mental health issues just seem to be swimming against the tide when those basics are not in place so i think there are lots of very passionate people but it, it's about how do you as i understand it from my perspective coordinate all those efforts against so many disparate systems and, and states. Yeah, and let me just plug the health affairs, uh, did a special issue on this about a year ago on perinatal mental health. And the over, and full disclosure, I had two pieces in there. Um, one of the fundamental, I think, themes that came out of that was the need for community-based care and to really center community-based organizations that were providing perinatal mental health services. Shout out to Kay Matthews and the Shades of Blue Project in Houston, Texas. There are nonprofit organizations that are led by Black women who are really trying to address some of the perinatal mental health issues. But, you know, to Fiona's point, you know, without having, you know, a single payer or some centralized repository or some way to be able to align, you know, mental and behavioral health with physical health, which is not exclusive to perinatal 
universe, by the way, right? We separate those things in just how we pay for them here in the United States. Until we fix that structural problem, that's a retrofit, we won't be able to reform the provision of community health services. And then we can't reimagine, well, what does all that look like anyway outside of you know, a clinical health providing structure? That's why we're not all having the same conversation. I'd love to hear more on just the idea of parental leave and what that uh, allowing or ensuring parental leave in the United States, what does the data show us on what that could mean in terms of maternal health? I mean, I think there's so much evidence that early input, that first 1,000 days for, for children, but having support for women around that period and birthing people and for partners uh, as well, uh, because in the Nordic states uh, in Europe, they have shared parental leave as well. So they have up to a year of leave that's shared within the family as the family sees fit. And if you're you know, a, a single family, you can take all of that leave yourself, but it's, it's up to the families and to, to decide how that's best distributed. And they of course have some of the best outcomes. So I think it's it's very clear from what you could say was a sort of global design of these different health systems that actually having that leave and support at that time and having paid leave uh, makes such a huge difference. Another question here from the audience. I'm a postpartum nurse in Boston and the increase of immigrant families is overwhelming. How should we best support these mothers trying to negotiate their family survival, their own health survival while looking for housing and social services? It's straining all healthcare stakeholders help. Maybe Dr. Sidonaris that wants to speak to that. Sure. Yeah, I think it's really important to think about person-centered care, particularly for folks like immigrant communities and families. I mean, immigrants are really dealing with these broader structural factors like fear of the immigration enforcement system, racial profiling, surveillance in their daily lives. What does that mean for a mother? but also their families. I mean, even though fear, you know, deportation disproportionately occurs among men, the impacts that this has for women and their children and their families cannot be overemphasized. And so I think that in terms of thinking about immigrants and their families, I mean, I, I talked about language as a very easy first step that you need to do, um, not just you know providing informed consent, but doing it in languages that folks can understand. Um, this is particularly true for um, Asian immigrant communities where you have a number of different languages spoken across ethnicities. Um, and then I think that there needs to be broader structural policy changes. And so both integration policies that include immigrant families, um, whether that's through employment or legal means um, or education, but also decriminalizing immigration policies. Anyone else wanna to speak to that one? and supporting immigrant families? Well, I think part of why it feels like a strain is because we haven't made robust investments in the social safety net. So we try and address everything in healthcare. And as, as long as that continues to be a thing, right? The, the addressing of social needs in the context of health services. I, I, have, I know I'm unpopular for saying this, but I'm gonna say it because that's just who I am. And that is, we, we, it is an excuse to think that we can ad address social needs adequately in the context of health services, just because we think that's where the money is and that's where the infrastructure is. That's a problem. Medicalizing everything is not helpful. And so at some point we have to find the language and the political will to talk about what's the public good that comes out of these strategic investments, right? As opposed to trying to address everything as a, as a clinical or a medical problem. Another audience question here. I'm interested to know your thoughts on getting fathers, men, partners involved in work surrounding maternal mortality. How do we get people to view maternal mortality as a public health issue for the entire family and by extension society? Dr. Armstrong, do you have any thoughts on that one? Uh, 
I think that the um, the intuition behind that question is that we need to think about families as units and birth as something that's happening in the context of a larger unit. It's not something that's happening in or to an individual solely, uh, and that bringing in a wide range of support partners of both genders, uh, other family members and kin that we have to acknowledge, and I, this goes back to what Dr. McLemore was saying about preventing support people from coming into the hospitals in the early days of COVID, you know, and then allowing like very specific support people to come into the hospital. We have to recognize that that people's lives have um, tremendous kind of diversity in the texture of who their support and care networks are formed by. Not everyone is the, um, you know, kind of 1950s nuclear family that we often idealize in the United States. And so I think it's a conversation about bringing fathers and male partners, but it's also a conversation about bringing in grandmothers and aunties and uh, siblings and, you know, the, the whole, like really treating birth and reproduction as part of a family unit, not something that's happening in a single individual. So that's that's kind of how I would think about responding um, to that question. So yeah, the dads are important, but so is the auntie and the the granny and the sister. And like you know, we we have to think about all these people as being part of um, the unit, family unit that is experiencing the reproductive event. So when a, a person in the U.S. goes to their first prenatal appointment, from the, the, the very beginning, it just seems like the conversation is always about how to make sure the baby stays healthy, which is, of course, so critical to make sure the baby is healthy. Um, but uh, what do we do to flip that conversation a bit so that it's also about the mother, the, the pregnant person and their health and their well-being because they're also a person who matters? I mean, it so clearly should be that way, but yeah, just to sort of re-emphasize again, uh, what's made the difference here, I think is just, you know, it's perverse to wait for the evidence. Oh, this isn't how it should be. So then come back to change what seems very intuitive, but it's like, if you look after the whole unit that has benefits for the, the child, for the mother, for the other parent, it's, it, the evidence is really clear. So I think, that's what's helped here, bringing that to mind and showing the, the cost effectiveness of those approaches is really the only thing that has made the, you know, the, the government actually change policy and put money behind it. Changing culture seems to me to be, you know, part of that, that the culture's there, but we have to have the structures in place to make it happen. Well, it looks like we are coming to the end of our time. So I just want to thank everybody so much for your comments. And um, I, I learned a lot here and I appreciate it. And uh, it, was, it was an honor to moderate this conversation. I will turn it back over to Dean Galea. Well, thank you very much, Bianca. And really thank you to um, all of you for um, a terrific conversation. And I want to thank the audience. I, I thought the uh, the questions were outstanding, as were the comments back and forth. I've been sort of my heads are pinging from the Q and A to the to the chat box uh, all throughout. I um, I really admired uh, the conversation and uh, thought that uh, should be sort of required viewing and listening for anybody who cares about these topics. Thank you for everything you are doing to move this issue forward. Thank you for everything you do every day to make the world a better place. It's a privilege to uh, have you join us today. Everybody, thank you. Have a good afternoon. Have a good evening. Take good care. <laughs>